What's up guys, welcome back to the channel, BC coming at you with all the latest in the pro wrestling world. There's a lot to get to, not a lot of time to get to it. So we're going to skip the cold open teaser if you don't mind and just start rocking these stories out. I want to start with the Raw and SmackDown commentary teams. They are now set. WWE has made this official on SmackDown starting September 13th, the big move to the USA Network. Michael Cole will be realigning with Corey Graves. We saw a little taste of that again this past Monday with Pat McAfee now gone. That's going to be your team going forward for the USA Network. September 13th, the big debut. Smackdown, Michael Cole, Corey Graves. Now on Monday Night Raw, you are going to start getting the team of Wade Barrett from Smackdown. He will now be on Monday Night Raw, and he will be aligned with Joe Tessatore, ESPN journalist slash broadcaster. Uh, Tessatore will be debuting with the company on Monday Night Raw. We can only hope this goes off without a hitch. There has been a lot of people they tried out in this position, and they all found out quickly how hard it is. The company realized you can't just pluck any individual with some broadcast experience and putting them on a show like Monday Night Raw, you're not going to get Jim Ross. You're not going to get anywhere near. You're not going to get anywhere near a Michael Cole. You're not going to get a Tony Schiavone. You're sure as hell ain't going to get a Moro Ronaldo. You're not going to get a Lord Alfred Hayes or a Gorilla Monsoon. It's not going to happen. And that's how hard it is. And that's why you saw Adnan Verk come in and quickly go out. That's why you saw Jimmy Smith quickly come in, quickly go out, and so many others. The truth is, we never got the next Jim Ross in WWE, right? When Jim Ross and WWE parted ways, Michael Cole stepped up big. And as good as Michael Cole has been, and he has been damn good, he never was truly right there with Jim Ross, right? Jim Ross was the best of the best in his prime. Nobody could level up to Jim Ross status. And it was the perfect storm in what was known as the Attitude Era. It was he and Jerry Lawler. You just could not beat that team. But Michael Cole at that same time was playing a solid number two. And when Jim Ross and WWE parted ways, Michael Cole became a solid number one. He was the new standard. But he was still a level away from Jim Ross, right? He was never going to reach that but Michael Cole was a solid next choice. Now the problem is forget talk of being the next Jim Ross. We don't even see the next Michael Cole in WWE, right? Michael Cole is nearing the end of his commentary career. I, st I do believe he's going to stick with WWE. He's highly respected. He has a, a big position in WWE. He literally leads the commentary teams, guys. That, like his title, it's not just him behind the headset. He runs the entire commentary team. Everything goes through him. He's the one who single-handedly brought Pat McAfee back. He's the one who's navigating through these new teams with Hunter Hearst Helmsley. So we don't even have the next Michael Cole in line. Vic Joseph from NXT, I guess, would be the closest. We're going to try out Tessa Torre. Corey Graves is more of the color guy, not necessarily play-by-play. -play. He's been doing decent on SmackDown, but that's not his strong suit. It's not where he's comfortable. So Corey Graves, long-term doing what Jim Ross and Michael Cole has done, it's not going to fit. He's so much better being that color guy, and that's exactly what he's going to do when him and Michael Cole reunite September 13th for SmackDown on USA. He's going right back to where he is best suited. Vic Joseph, again, I guess would be the closest. Mauro Ronaldo has been grabbed up by Maple Leaf Wrestling from Scott D'Amore from TNA, formerly with TNA, started his own promotion, and he somehow landed Mauro Ronaldo. So that's the commentary situation, guys. I, I don't see... Tessa Torre, this is going to be massive. They're just throwing this guy into the lion's den with the lion's... Staring at him, not eating for days, right? These lions have not been fed for days. They're hungry. They throw Tessa Torre in there. It's either going to be like Adnan Verk and Jim Smith where it just failed miserably and they didn't last long. Or Joe Tessa Torre is going to knock it out of the park. Grand slam status. He got this position because of Dwayne Johnson. 
right? That big interview around WrestleMania for ESPN. And then right around then, right after that is when talk started of Tessa Torre going to WWE. So uh, I'm hoping. Seems like a good dude. He's got good knowledge of the industry. Is this going to work? We've seen so many journalists and broadcast specialists come in and try to do the job that Jim Ross and even Mike Cole has done. And they fail miserably. They're not even 10% of these individuals. I'm not asking for another Gorilla Monsoon, Jim Ross, or even a Michael Cole. It would be great. I'm just asking for somebody that is not like nails on a chalkboard three hours every Monday night. Or two hours on Friday. Or three to four on a pay-per-view PLE. These are big moves, man. Forget the show switching up. Smackdown going to USA September 13th. Raw going to Netflix in a few months. Now, who we're listening to, these teams are changing. Pat McAfee is out. Cole and Graves reuniting. And a newbie, Tessa Torre, with a Wade Barrett from SmackDown. That's your new team, bro. It'll take some getting used to. I just hope we're all along for the ride and it goes good. Because the last thing you want is three hours of a bad commentary team. Because we've gotten that so many times within the last several years. That's the uh, news on the commentary teams, guys. Hopefully I kept you up to date and didn't confuse you too much. And a little uh, good discussion on top of it as well. Sticking with uh, WWE, uh, Jesse Ventura, legend Jesse Ventura, uh, is now stating that he has a Legends deal about to be signed. This is a quote from Jesse Ventura. A deal is imminent. Contracts have been written and agreed upon. He says all that's left is two signatures, theirs and mine. It'll be official soon because time is money, end quote. Time is money. So this dude is just, you know, you get later on in life, you start thinking of your financials and you're like, all right, I have to start tapping in the resources that I once blocked. He had this tumultuous relationship with WWE, especially Vincent Kennedy. But now he's like, all right, it's Hunter. Maybe I can squeeze some business out of him. And it looks like that's what he's doing. That's a ballsy statement to end it with. It'll be official soon because time is money. It's almost like he's the one who's saying, I'm calling the shots here. (laughs) I'm running Hunter Hearst Helmsley. And this deal is going to get done when I want, how I want. Uh, Listen, I love Jesse Ventura. You guys know that legend personified, but uh, you know, he's got to realize it's a different WWE too. You're not in charge of this situation. Be happy. You're getting a deal because this dude, he, he tried to, he tried to body slam WWE many times. You can easily say justifiably. So by the way, like unionization, right? And Hulk Hogan ratted him out. That's a a story for another day. We don't have the time in this upload, unfortunately. But Hulk Hogan ratted him out. He tried to unionize everybody in WWE to go against Vince and Kennedy and change the landscape of the business, not just the company. But thankfully and luckily for Vincent anyway, thankfully if you're Vince and Kennedy, Hulk Hogan ratted him out. And uh, that was the end of that relationship. Vince ended up bringing him back years later. Uh, Once again, Jesse Ventura had so many demands and Vince was like, this is not worth the headache. So he was once again on the outside of WWE and that's how it stayed for decades. So now a new Legends deal for Jesse Ventura. You don't get a lot of money from this, but to these legends, you know, just have a contract with WWE and to be getting paid for them by them. It's pretty big for these individuals. I just would like to know the fine details in that because Jesse Ventura just does not let you use his likeliness or imaging or anything without like getting paid a good sum of money himself. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those deals where this dude's getting bare minimum 40% for himself. And that may not sound like a lot, but you know, at least they're getting 60% piece. 40%. Most of these legends deal, you'd be lucky if you're getting 20 We'll stick WWE. This was a big story uh, over the last 24 hours, gained a lot of traction. And and what made it even bigger was that the story ended up being false. It was not accurate. <laughs> so if you don't know, this was the story of WWE's Performance Center being removed from Orlando and being repositioned in Vegas. 
Meltzer ran with this story. The votes of wrestling and so many others. And WWE quickly refuted and debunked the story. They said not true. There are no plans to remove the Performance Center from Orlando and put it into uh, Vegas. So what made this story seem pretty valid, what made it believable is because it's Vegas, right? And for the UFC... Vegas is their central hub. It's what Orlando is to WWE, their central hub for development and such. And that's what that's what Vegas is to UFC. And of course, that is such a big part of TKO Endeavor's business. Vegas is their hub. That's why WrestleMania is going to Vegas and not Minneapolis when they were the front runners. And at the last second, WWE had to take that deal off the table. Vegas will always win out. So even though this story ended up being false, it is not accurate. The Performance Center, as of now anyway, is not being removed from Orlando and being replaced in Vegas. Even though that part of it is not true, what is absolutely true is that there was a meeting from Shapiro, from TKO and Endeavor president and vice president, and they did talk about more business being done in Vegas that used to be done in Orlando or is currently being done but will no longer be done. Developmental, NXT, everything you see at the PC, a lot of that is going to Vegas. So you do have to ask, is it only a matter of time before before everything does get moved to Vegas? Before Orlando is just a distant memory for WWE developmental. Because that part was brought up in those meetings. A lot more is going to be happening in Vegas. It's easier for them, guys. It's UFC Central Hub. They're already established. Right? Endeavor already owned UFC way before WWE. Things are set in place. They like the business over there. They like the model that they have. Vegas is their central hub. Orlando is like that distant stepchild. But it means a lot to a a lot of individuals like Hunter Hearst Helmsley. They're going to keep it around for a while. So even though this story is false, from what we're hearing from WWE themselves, just remember, just keep that in, in the subconscious that down the road, down the pipeline, I wouldn't be shocked if we hear that they are going to Vegas But as of now, a lot of individuals um, just kind of jumped the shark on that one. That was not what happened. That's not what was said in the meeting. There was a meeting. A lot more business will be going over to Vegas, and that's where it ends as of now. Orlando will remain central hub for development for WWE. And lastly, for WWE anyway. um, SmackDown and Raw's ratings for this week. SmackDown. Scores a two, can I say scores? I don't know, man. They dropped to a 2.05. They're now just barely hanging on to over 2 million viewers. You guys remember when it's good, when SmackDown is good, you know, you're up there with 2324. You know, when they're advertising some good stuff, you got Roman out there, you're at a 2324. Um, bare minimum, two, 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 one. If, if, if you have stiff competition and you didn't put your best foot forward, maybe you see a two, one, five, two, one, six, um, to see a two, oh, five, two point zero, five, two point zero, five. That is very telling. And that's a big reason why Fox was like, we don't want to renew this deal. We want to be done with. Friday Night Wrestling. We want to be done with the WWE. We don't feel we're getting a good return on on our investment. 2.05. No Roman, guys. Looks like no ratings. For Friday nights, anyway. I don't want to put it all on one dude. But without Roman Reigns, Friday Night is struggling. The heels on Friday Night SmackDown, they're not there, man. Solo Sokoa is a dude who lost 41 matches in a row after he beat John Cena. And then magically, you wave the Harry Potter Expecto Petroleum wand. And all of a sudden, Solo is in main events at SummerSlam when he lost 41 matches in a row. A lot of fans are like, "Eh, uh, he doesn't feel like a main eventer. So you bring in Jacob Fatu. All right, he's got the look a little more, right? He's a little more vicious. We can believe in this. And he hasn't lost 41 matches in a row yet. Then he gets injured. 
They tried to protect him a little. We're at that stage where Jacob Fatu has the potential to be massive in this company and a big heel, but we're not there yet. And the numbers are showing you that. And then you just take away Roman Reigns from these shows and 2.0 down from the 2.1, what was it? 2.16, 2.17. So another 150,000 viewers said, no, thank you. Deuces, Zeus's. And they took off. Guys, you're 50,000 viewers away from dropping under 2 million. And this is Fox broadcast, not cable, broadcast television, and they can't even hit 2 million. That's what you're telling me if you take 49,000 viewers away. And they just lost a buck 50 plus. So it's very, you could very easily lose another 49,000. You could easily make the argument that no Roman equals no ratings. And Monday Night Raw, if you're wondering, 1.7. That's up from last week's 1.6. That's the good news. The bad news, with NFL football around the corner, 1.7. They can't even sniff 2.0 anymore. I, I, sadly, guys, I think the days of getting 2 million viewers for WWE television is done. I don't think it's going to happen. Or and you'd have to stack the show. But 2 million, on Monday nights anyway, again, SmackDown, broadcast television, they've been getting 2. 2, 3, 2, 4 on the high end, 2, 1, 2, 2 low end, and for some reason, 2, 0, 5 on this one. This was their lowest in a couple of months, I believe. You'd have to go back a couple months to like early part of June when they were just hovering over 2. So for Monday Night Raw, I, I don't know if you're going to get back to two now. I, I don't think that's possible. And then in a few months, you're going to Netflix anyway. So they just care about the streaming side of it. They just want you watching as much Raw as imaginable. They don't care if it's a week later, right? It's all about the hours that are streamed. That's why they're not going to get rid of that third hour. That's what's most attractive to Netflix. Three hours every single Monday. And then we put it up for the streaming on Tuesday, Wednesday, no matter when you watch it. That's three hours. And every week we got another th new three hours. I mean, that's what's most attractive to Netflix. They're not getting rid of that third hour. So with a few months of ratings left, guys, I don't know if we're ever going to get back to 2-0 on a Monday night. And that's telling. That tells you a lot about the audience that is tuning in live. Forget the cord cutting or highlights the next day. Streaming services, who's watching live, who is sitting on their couch watching live because Monday Night Raw is must-see TV. Their new average is 1617, and they don't even have football competition. When the NFL comes in just a couple weeks, are you telling me their new normal is 1415 high end? By the end of the NFL season. Are we talking about a million viewers for Monday Night Raw? One, 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 two? Is that how low we have sunk? It's rhetorical. The answer is yes. A one, seven with no football competition. And that's been their average all year long. And SmackDown, two, zero, five. They have to get Roman Reigns back. Or at least they have to create new larger than life stars. Cody Rhodes isn't cutting it anymore, clearly. And random matches like Kevin Owens versus Cody is not cutting it. That's not BC telling you this. I'm preaching the facts. I'm reciting the facts to you, but that's the numbers telling you this. Two, zero, five. SmackDown. I'm sure Fox is like, that's all right. In a couple weeks, <laughs> we're giving them Das Boot anyway. We're done with it. We can pull a lot. We can pull a lot better advertiser revenue for a lot less money, right? No matter what they put in Friday nights, maybe they'll score one four one five, but it'll cost them a lot less. They can make it two to three hours and then get a lot more money because this deal did not end up lucrative for Fox. And if this drops within the next couple weeks under 2 million, Fox is going to be begging for USA to take this early. SmackDown, 205, Raw, 1.7. We'll talk some AEW in just a minute, but I want a little bit of a bridge to get us to that. So we'll talk an individual that's not contracted to any company right now, but he is a former WWE talent, Gable Steveson. Gable Steveson has just been cut from... The Bills, wavered from the Bills, doesn't mean he's 
um, fully gone from the team. They could always ask him back. But as of now, he just could not cut it in the football world. He is one of many who could not cut it in the football world. Big names, too, guys. Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, Goldberg, so many others. The NFL was just too tough for him. These are big names in the WWE world. Gable Steveson is unfortunately the latest. Uh, the Bills gave him a chance, even though, from what I heard, he had never played football before. But the Bills gave him a chance because he's athletic and he came from the Olympics. Same thing WWE did. They gave this dude a chance because they thought he could be the next Kurt Angle. How many times do we hear that, right? This person and that person, they're going to be the next Kurt Angle. We hear it with Jason Jordan, Chad Gable, Gable Steveson, and so many others. And what they fail to realize is Kurt Angle was next level. Kurt Angle had a personality and charisma that most wrestlers, the majority back then and still today the majority, they don't have that personality. They don't, they don't have that charisma. Kurt Angle was next level. You could laugh at and with Kurt Angle during a segment and in that same segment be in awe of the seriousness of Kurt Angle. That's how good he was. You can't just take somebody like Gable Steveson, who is an, unfortunately a charisma vacuum. He could walk into a lively party and the party would go absolutely silent and dead in seconds when he walks in because he has sucked up the charisma out of the room. That's Gable Steveson. It's sad to say, but in the realm of professional wrestling where you have to be the opposite, Gable Steveson had no personality and no charisma. And when he got in the ring, the audience would rather take a nap they told you that through their silence. And silence is louder than a billion words at times. Right? That it fact. It's the same thing with commentators. We were talking about commentators earlier in this upload. The Adnan Verks, the Jimmy Smiths, right? Why didn't it work? They didn't have that it factor for pro wrestling to be on a headset and behind a microphone and carrying a three hour show, telling those stories, calling that action. They just weren't good at it, man. It's it factor. There's nothing you could have done. Kevin Patrick is the same thing. Kevin Patrick is a good dude. He was good interviewing backstage. I thought that was perfect for him. You put him on headset. You put him behind that microphone. It was rough. He didn't have that it factor. And they didn't understand no matter how much you try to train him, no matter how much time passes by, you hope he gets better. Without that it factor, you're putting him in a jam. You can do better as a company. Kevin Patrick deserves better. By just telling him the truth, this isn't going to work. Gable Steveson, you had to tell him the truth. This isn't going to work. Thankfully, WWE did that. They didn't let, let a lot more time pass. They heard the, the critics loudly. They showed up to his matches and realized quickly, this isn't working. And the dude had to get cut. So then he tried his hand at NFL football as if that was going to be easier or that was going to be his it factor, right? That's what he was naturally born to do. When the dude, from what I hear, has not played a lick of football in his life, he thought NFL was the way to start. Hey, at least he tried. He got the chance from the Bills, but the Bills cut him. So we'll see. We'll see if he stays cut. If another team maybe, you know, he got wavered, so maybe another team picks him. Maybe the Bills try again, but it... It seems pretty quickly, just a few weeks ago, we found out that he was part of the Bills practice squad and trying to work his way up. And then we find out just a few weeks later, no, that that didn't work. So he tried his hand at, at, at pro wrestling, did not work. Tried his hand at the NFL, did not work. Just because you're an amateur wrestler and you make it to the Olympics does not mean you're going to be a star NFL football player or a superstar pro wrestler. And I hope this was finally the lesson learned from WWE and pro wrestling in totality. Stop looking at Olympic athletes and thinking they're going to be WWE or pro wrestling superstars. Because chances are they're not going to have the personality, the charisma, the drive, the it factor that is needed. It's completely different. So Gable Steveson, guys, I know I, we talked about this just a few weeks ago about how he has uh, been picked up by the Bills. Well, now he has been let go just as quickly by the Bills. Go over to AEW. Ricochet, his first opponent. One-on-one -on -one has been announced. It's actually going to be tonight, Dynamite. Kyle Fletcher. Ky I, I gave you guys a moment to get truly excited. Ricochet versus Kyle Fletcher. But I know. But you see, 
It's going to be a good wrestling match. <laughs> Meltzer's going to give it six stars. We're going to be on the tweeter machine going, this is awesome. <laughs> I know, I know. Trust me, it's going to get stars. We're going to talk about how much of a... Oh, we're we going to use the word banger, maybe? It was a... Ricochet and Fletcher was a banger. I know. Uh, listen, this is weird booking. You, you know, promoting a Fletcher Ricochet match, uh, debuting Ricochet in the casino. But I mean, like, and, and not even winning it, by the way. So he's in there with a bunch of other dudes, doesn't even win it. And then afterwards, he's fighting fans online who, like, all they said, they weren't even being that mean. They were just like, how many months is it before a Ricochet is irrelevant? And they were just saying because Tony brings in all these names and in just weeks, it's like they're just another spoke on the wheel and he's on to the next toy. That's all they're saying. It wasn't even directed at Ricochet. Don't know if it was a tag or not, but Ricochet just went off and he started going off on a lot of fans. Just to, You can't do that, man. They have every right to go, wait a second. This isn't the best way to like, even they know that they're not booking the show. They're not the head of creative. They understand that. Most are probably saying they they don't know if or they, they couldn't care less to do a better job than Tony Khan. They just know that this isn't it for Ricochet. That's all they're saying. They have every right to say, hey, you know what? That's not the best way to debut this guy because it didn't do anything for most of us. So for Ricochet to start jabbing back at fans, that's not a good look. It's very immature and I would, I would strongly suggest that you just stay off that. Just stay off of that. Concentrate on how you are going to be a better ricochet than you were in WWE. How are you going to get farther? Or is it you just is are we just going to rely on just the flips and the dives and the the moves, I guess, right? He just wants to try to collect all the stars from Meltzer. Maybe that's just ricochet. That's what you're going to see. Storylines will be secondary. His larger than life status will be non-existent still. But you're going to get good wrestling matches. Maybe that's all he came to do. Collect a good paycheck from Tony Khan and just be another spoke on the wheel. But fans, he can argue with fans all he wants. They have every right because they're actually correct. This is a very odd way to bring in Ricochet. The debut at All In was very odd. This singles match that they're promoting? I'm not saying you start off with Ricochet Will Ospreay, but Fletcher Ricochet. All right. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. It just feels very anticlimactic from the jump. It already seems like he's just a spoke on the wheel. The dude just debuted this weekend. And on the flip side, for the ladies of AEW, Brittany Baker's backlash continues. In fact, it continues to rise. A lot of people in the industry, a lot of AEW fans are just upset with Britt Baker. They feel she totally dogged it in her match with Mercedes this past weekend. I didn't get to see all of this event at Wembley Stadium. I did, I was able to catch most of the Mercedes-Britt Baker match because I put both ladies on a pedestal. Mercedes, one of the best, if not the best, professional wrestler for the ladies on the planet. And Britt Baker, I've always felt that she just is exactly what AEW needed. Especially at a time where they needed it the most. Britt Baker put that company on her back for the ladies. For the ladies... Um, at a time when they needed it, they needed that one person where the women's division can kind of just, you know, center around. And that was Britt Baker. So I put both ladies up on a pedestal. I was really looking forward to that match. So I went out of my way to catch most of that. And uh, I, I was completely disappointed. It was it was not good at all. And, and yeah, most of it seemed like it was coming from Baker. I don't know if she was intentionally doing it. I don't want to believe that. Um, she's had issues in that locker room with people like Thunder Rosa, but after a while, it was clear that Rosa was the common denominator. Like, it wasn't just Britt Baker and her friends being the mean girls, right? It was people like Jade Cargill, who was not part of Britt's circle. They were good, they were nice, cordial. You could say friends, but that, Jade Cargill was not part of her group, and Jade had issues with Thunder uh, Rosa. You had Tony Storm, who was absolutely not part of Britt's clique. And Tony Storm had issues with Rosa. So it came out pretty quickly as much as Britt Baker got all the flack for that. After a while, it was pretty clear that Thunder Rosa was no angel in this situation. And the common denominator for everybody's you know, kind of ire. They just, something was not right. 
and they felt that the way Rosa was going about business, just not right. But Baker took a lot of flack for that, and I don't think it's ever truly been rectified. And now you have a situation like this where Mercedes comes in. It's pretty clear that a lot of people are now going to look at her as the centerpiece to the division. Baker has to take the second fiddle. Has to. Some people would say Tony Storm's even above, but that's another story. But for Mercedes, it's clear that that's who's going to be on the posters. That's who's going to be on on the promotional material. That's going to be on the billboards. That's going to be on the pay-per-view sheets. It's all going to be Mercedes more than Britt Baker. So maybe Baker went into business for herself and said, I'm not going to make you look good. We always talk about everybody's best match being Mercedes. Maybe Baker was like, this ain't going to be one of them. They're going to talk about a bad Mercedes match. It's possible. I don't want to think because I put Britt Baker on such a pedestal. I don't want to think that she would do that. But the match was really bad. It was mostly from her end. You know, people have bad nights at the job site, right? I want to chalk this up to just a a rough night at the factory. That's what I want to believe anyway, because to think that she would sabotage this on her own, just so everybody can see that Mercedes does have a bad match, you're only hurting yourself. Everybody knows Mercedes can have a classic with a broomstick, but yet Britt Baker can't get a good match from her. So you'd only be hurting yourself. I, I, I want to chalk this up. I, I want to believe anyway that this was just a bad night at the office. And no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get on the same page as Mercedes. She couldn't put the train back on the track. She could not get focused. I would like to see them one more time. I know that is a hot take. But I have to believe they do much better than what we saw this weekend. That cannot be the best for Mercedes and Britt Baker. I refuse to believe that. And yes, I fully agree that Britt Baker was the one who put up the clunker. But I I can't believe that this was just sabotage purposefully. There's no way, man. I didn't see evidence of that. I just saw just somebody who just was having a very big off night with one of her biggest matches of her career. It's the, it's one of the worst times you can have an off night <laughs> with one of the most, you know, one of your biggest matchups. The the microscope just right on you. And, and that's when, unfortunately, you put up a clunker. But sometimes it, it happens. But Baker is receiving massive backlash from this still. A lot of people do believe that this was just purposeful. You know, like the, she has it intent just to make Mercedes look bad. Britt doesn't care anyway. She knows she's going to have her spot. A lot of fans, for whatever reason, they don't like Britt Baker anyway. So I'm sure maybe Baker was kind of like, what are they going to do? You know, I mean, they already hurl insults. They already don't like me anyway. You know, it's one of those let's give them something to cry about situations. It's possible. It's possible. I saw it. It wasn't good. I saw Britt Baker completely off her game. Did I think it warranted this much backlash? No. But I think that goes hand in hand with there's just a disconnect with a lot of fans in Britt Baker. And even though she is still a centerpiece for the women's division and in AEW, a lot of fans, and I'm talking AEW diehards, they don't look at her as the top of the heap. They look at people like Tony Storm now. They already plays Mercedes there. Maybe they got Mariah up there. But Britt Baker, in their eyes, has been demoted several spots. And Britt Baker is over there going, nope, I'm still that centerpiece. I'm still the nucleus to this division, to this company. How you look at MJF for the dudes, that's how you're going to look at me. But matches like what we saw this weekend is not going to help the cause. Massive backlash. I hope that it gets rectified by letting these ladies go one more time. And maybe the best way to do it is not at a pay-per-view. <laughs> I mean, all outs coming up. Maybe they do the rematch there. Maybe it's already been announced by the time you guys see this. But to make sure that the pressure is a little less, maybe do it on a dynamite. Pop a rating instead of trying to get the extra cash from the pay-per-view. Maybe that'll ease up the pressure. You still pop a rating, hopefully. And maybe we get a much better match. Guys, that's what I got for you, man. As I told you, there was a lot of stories to go over. And hold on. Oh, by the way, real quick, before I wrap this up, November 4th's Monday Night Raw, guys, is going to be a taping from Saudi Arabia. 
It's not, like a Clorox wipe, 99.99%. This story is confirmed. It's that 1.001% that, that I just have to get confirmed. Okay, but 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 I, I'm confident enough to give you this info uh, that it is accurate. The November 4th, coming up in just a couple months, that Monday Night Raw will be a tape show. We are hearing it's going to be taped the Sunday the 3rd while they're in Saudi Arabia, the day after their crown jewel, I think it is. The day late, so they're going to stay there, record that Monday Night Raw, and then that's going to air that following Monday. So it's going to be from Saudi Arabia. That's the big news. Monday Night Raw, first ever Raw from Saudi. It's going to be taped on that Sunday for Monday. It's going to be on the weekend of the Crown Jewel event. That is what we are hearing. 99.99% sure that is confirmed. I will get the official confirmation for you, hopefully within the next 24 to 48 hours. Until next time, there will be that next time. BC in the unit. Saying check you.